Welcome, I'm Marcus Quigley. Today I wanted to start out with an example, in fact, one of the finest examples of engineering data collection and presentation I've seen in my career. Let me share my screen here. This is a detailed record of the flows of the Mississippi River and its principal tributaries. Take a moment to absorb this graph. The rhythms of one of the most critical features of the United States in intricate detail. The pulse of the nation, of commerce, of flooding, of climate and weather on a single sheet of paper de depicting more than a decade of data from 20 different stations. Pretty stunning. It's not just beautiful though, it's a masterwork that bridges the gap between complex hydrologic data and human understanding. I step back and it makes me think about the fact that we live in an amazing age, that the ability to collect such comprehensive data is a product of our times, of technology, of intent, of ambition, and where we are headed. I spent a good portion of my career seeking to collect data like this, to deploy novel technologies into the environment and to use data in new ways to solve seemingly intractable problems. And this chart is pretty impressive. It feels like a product of our current age, a symbol of modern technological prowess, like real-time data source from a sophisticated set of sensors scattered across the river system. But I, and I know something you don't know yet. As modern as it may seem, this chart is actually a leap back in time. This data and chart itself is not from last year, or not even last decade. It's a hidden treasure that dates back more than a century to a period between 1871 and 1899. It encapsulates an historical snapshot of the river system from a period nestled between post-war reconstruction and the dawn of a new century. It's an exhibit, many, one of many, contained in volume two of the Chief Engineer's Report to the War Department, a precursor to the Army Corps from 1900. In fact, even more amazingly, it's drawn on a single sheet of four by eight sheet paper, carefully folded in a five inch thick volume sent to Congress and destined for the shelves of the Library of Congress. Here's a copy of the book. But you're probably not here today for a history lesson, and I'm not intending to give one. But I do have a few questions. First, in a world of instant information, what matters? What is the right pace of information and action? Let's look at this question a little bit more closely. What data should we be collecting at what frequency, and what is it all for? Let's turn our attention back to the Mississippi River. How much data do we need to characterize the hydrograph well at the stations in the chart? It turns out we should be collect data at about 0.0000187 hertz. I know that's a lot of zeros, but it means that they could collected the data about once every few days. Clearly, you don't really need sub time, sub second real time information. In fact, you can probably have a half a dozen people ride their horses between stations on a regular circuit and do just fine. Let's look at a very different system, the noise recorded in my home on a typical Sunday afternoon in 2020. Note that to record the data well, I needed to use a much higher frequency, 48 kilohertz in this case. Why 48 kilohertz? Well, the electrical engineers, it turns out, thought this problem through a long time ago. In fact, the seminal paper was written by a very clever engineer named Claude Shannon in a 1949 paper. Note the rate is not named after him, but that's another longer story. What we now know is discussed in the paper is that the answer to my question is a very straightforward one. You have to sample at twice the frequency of the underlying signal, the Nyquist sampling rate. It turns out that there is a right pace for all information collection. It's twice the rate of the underlying signal. I will leave it up to you to explore the complex map behind this interesting and utterly elegant finding, but it tells us that if we are designing an audio CD, we need to sample at 48 kilohertz. That is if we wanna record in full fidelity, the sounds up to around 24 kilohertz, just above the limits of human hearing. If you wanna record the Mississippi River with full fidelity, you need to record about once per week because that's about twice as fast as the rise and falls in the river you want to record. So why does this all matter? It is intimately connected to our current situation. And it leads me to our second question. How do we engineer and build systems that are human-centered and acknowledge the unknown unknowns? The primary challenge as I see it is that we live in a non-stationary time. When I learned hydrology in graduate school, the concept of stationarity, particularly of systems like climate, were not even discussed, they were implicit. We designed bridges and dams and retaining walls and flood control systems and drainage 
based on what happened in the past. The primary means for predicting the future was to look backward. Throw in a factor of safety to address the part maybe we had some uncertainty about. Turns out that is not working so well for us now in many types of systems. So how do we design in a non-stationary world? Non-stationarity simply implies that we live in a world that is continuously changing and evolving. Factors such as climate change, technological innovation, and rapid population growth or migration make our environment or societies and our needs unstable and unpredictable. Non-stationarity is a norm, not the exception. And it's really that engineers must grapple uh, with this challenge. Now let's take a look, closer look at our existing infrastructure. Many of our systems are designed based on historical patterns. For instance, our stormwater systems. We, these systems are designed to handle rainfall patterns that due to climate change no longer match the realities we face today. We're now experiencing more intense, more frequent storms leading to flooding that our current infrastructure simply cannot handle. Furthermore, we may not always agree on how these systems behave or what the causes might be. The shortcomings of our existing infrastructure underline the pressing need for adaptability and sustainability. But what does that mean in practical terms? It means that we need to design systems that can adjust to changing conditions, that we can design dams that can be later modified without major new construction. It means that we can design stormwater systems that respond to rainfall and climate in real time based on forecast information a technology I spent a few, quite a few years inventing and perfecting. It means power grids and energy production and transportation systems and pipelines that can be adapted over time, repurposed, and used to achieve more than one goal. It means that we need to embrace forward-thinking design and that it considers not just present requirements, but anticipates future demands, not just through traditional forecasting and risk analysis, but through adaptability through designs that are not just robust to potential conditions, but that also acknowledge the unknown unknowns. This is the reality of being an engineer in the 21st century, and it might seem daunting, but it's also an exciting opportunity for innovation, creativity, and progress. Adaptable infrastructure isn't just a lofty ideal, it's an imperative for our time. As engineers, we are the bridge between today's challenges and tomorrow's solutions. Let's rise to the occasion and shape the future where our infrastructure is a testament to our ingenuity, foresight, and commitment to our collective future. Thank you.